Welcome to another episode of The Bitter Pill. So today I wanted to talk a bit about uh, the interview done a couple of days ago of Dr. Cornell West, the Green Party candidate for president, with Jimmy Dore of the Jimmy Dore Show. And as you can see from the title there, I, I was... Uh, more than a little frustrated with how Jimmy Dore conducted this interview. And the title is kind of an allusion to the way that Jimmy often talks down to people that he disagrees with, even in cases where he doesn't really know what he's talking about or doesn't really know any more than they do. Uh, which is not to say... On the other hand, that I don't think Jimmy made any good points. I, I think that, well, I, there were things that I disagreed with uh, with regard to both of them. And so what I wanted to do was I have a look at a good bit of this interview. And then as we go through it, I'll be commenting on it. Uh, so, so yeah, the title is admittedly clickbaity and doesn't reflect the fact that I'm critical of uh, both uh, Dr. West and uh, Mr. Dore during this interview and in other contexts. And, you know, I do endorse Cornell West for president. Um, I just don't think this was a very productive conversation. And that's largely Jimmy Dore's fault. And my uh, view. So, I mean, if you look back to Jimmy's interview, what was it, like a month ago with Robert F. Kennedy Jr., and compare how cordial Jimmy was to RFK Jr., despite the, the truly awful uh, position in my view, of RFK on uh, the Israel-Palestine issue. Uh, you know, compared to that, um, you know, Jimmy's tone toward Cornell West, who supposedly is a, a friend of his, uh, seemed just rather hostile, and, and you know, the atmosphere was just very tense right from the beginning. And at times he was practically yelling at Cornell uh, as we'll see. So, so let me just uh, go ahead and uh, you know, play a few things from this interview. Uh, let's see. Where do I want to start? Okay. All right, let's let's go from here. A reflection, my brother. Very much so. So now people make a big deal out of the fact that you endorsed Joe Biden in 2020 and now you're running against him. And the reason you well, what, what was the reason you endorsed him in 2020 and what has changed since? Yeah, one, I was thoroughly convinced that we needed an anti-fascist coalition and that included the kind of milk toast warmongering neoliberals like Biden. And now it's fairly clear Biden had four years. He had four years to steal the thunder from any kind of Trump challenge, four years to try to speak to the needs of poor and working people, four years to try to cut back on the military adventurism. That's been characteristic of his whole career. And it's clear to me now that if the only opposition to the escalating neo-fascism in the country is going to be Biden, 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 or Biden-like, then the fascism's coming anyway. We're going to have to have alternative vision, alternative institutions, alternative infrastructures. It has an alternative passion. And so if all we can do is produce democratic administrations that are caretakers, postponers of the Trump or Trump-like candidates, then the fascism's coming anyway. The only way you really get at the roots of fascism 
is the break from the corporate duopoly to show how the two-party system is an impediment for the unleashing not only of American democracy, but also trying to dismantle the empire in terms of the 800 military units around the world and the military budget taking 57 cents for every dollar. And so uh, I just want to interject here. You know, I could have told Cornell West that, uh, you know, like 25 years ago. Uh, the last time I voted for a Democrat for president was in 1992. And thereafter, I had supported Green Party candidates for president, and including uh, former Green candidate and independent Ralph Nader in 2004. And, uh, you know, it's been very clear to me for a long time that you know, in terms of uh, participation in electoral politics, really the only way to advance an agenda for uh, radical social change is to uh, you know, look outside the duopoly. And granted, uh, Cornell West has done just that at, at times. He was a, a big supporter of uh, you know, Ralph Nader's in 2000 and Jill Stein in 2016 and some of the other uh, green candidates for president and other offices. But uh, really kind of kind of taken in a bit by Obama in 2008. And, um, you know, then the holder nose and vote form attitude because Trump's worst attitude in, in 2020. Uh, so anyway, just wanted to throw that in. And then uh, uh, after we listen to this segment, we're going to have a look at uh, Cornell's rationale for supporting Cornell West in, excuse me, for supporting Joe Biden in uh, the fall of uh, 2020. Well, in that sense, there's been a shift. There's no doubt about that. Now, keep in mind, you know, I supported Ralph Nader and Jill Stein. And in between, I had, I had early supported Bill Bradley and I had, I had supported John Kerry as a kind of a, uh, anti, anti right wing coalition, too. So that my jazz like activity certainly can be characterized at times with a certain kind of inconsistency, but it's the timing of it. it each, each moment has its own context. So now uh, our friend Nick Cruz says that many climate activists have no idea how much they destroyed all their credibility by endorsing and supporting Joe Biden, the Nord Stream pipeline bomber, and the largest eco-terrorist in modern human history for president. Why should anyone take climate or environmental issues seriously when you obviously do not? Now, do you okay, well, <laughs> that's a very good point. Uh, I mean, you know, if... You take your movement into the Democratic Party. You know, history suggests uh, that lessens its credibility and it weakens it. Uh, you know, time after time, we see this uh, you know, with the anti-war movement against the um, Iraq War. That kind of died once a lot of anti-war activists uh, supported John Kerry, who was in fact pro-Iraq War, as a supposed alternative to warmonger uh, George Bush. Um, so let me just have a look back here at uh, Cornell West sort of explaining his vote for uh, Joe Biden, who he described as a neoliberal disaster uh, in November of 2020. Do that now. Okay, yes, here we go. So one day before Joe Biden officially became the president-elect, uh, Penn Justice Democrats and Penn Young Democratic Socialists of America hosted a uh, discussion about the future of leftist politics featuring Cornell West. West sharply critiqued, critiqued the Democratic Party, especially its failure to protect and uplift the working class, and cited frustration with, quote unquote, having to vote for Biden, whom he labeled a neoliberal disaster. What we got to vote for was the mediocre, milquetoast neoliberal centrist because he's better than fascism and a fascist catastrophe is worse than a 
neoliberal disaster. West said of his decision to vote for Biden in the election. Now we've just got to terms, come to terms with a neoliberal disaster. Well, um, I must say, and this is exactly what uh, Jimmy Dore uh, criticizes about um, Cornell West's um, you know, framing here is this characterization of uh, Biden as a mediocre, milquetoast, neoliberal centrist in contrast to Trump, who he labels a fascist. And if we look at um, Joe Biden's record over the uh, you know, half a century political career that he has had, it's quite clear that he's much, much worse than you know, a uh, centrist or mediocrity or you know, milk toast, which implies he's, you know, uh, in the words of Douglas Adams, mostly harmless. And he is anything but that. And Let me just, uh, I'll, I'll play a little more of the interview here, and then I'll you know, contrast what you just heard. No, I think I'll go ahead and say what I said about um, Mr. Biden as well as his opponent, uh, Bernie Sanders. Let's see. Am I there yet? No. Okay. I don't know why I can't just switch to a different screen. Okay, here we go. Shouldn't be this complicated. Okay, uh, this is from an article I wrote about the uh, uh, 2020 election during the uh, uh, you know, kind of post-primary, pre-general election stage. Um, and it was very hard on both Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden, as you'll see here. Uh, so as I, as I said, uh, at least rhetorically, Sanders was the most progressive candidate with a sustained presence in the Democratic primaries other than Tulsi Gabbard, who, uh, uh, you know, in my assessment uh, at the time, uh, was not as good as on domestic issues uh, as Sanders was, uh, although pretty good, uh, but uh, much, much better than Sanders in terms of foreign policy. Um, so I said of Sanders, he deserves credit for emphasizing the extent and injustice of economic inequality in this country and calling out the corruption of the billionaire class. Um, but again and again, he pulled his punches against the Democratic establishment, even going so far as to criticize his own campaign surrogate, Zephyr Teachout, for documenting Joe Biden's long history of corruption and saying that he wasn't corrupt. <laughs> Joe Biden, of all people, is not corrupt. Uh, we could see the writing on the wall in 2016 when after running a campaign in which he called out the Democratic establishment to a considerable extent, uh, he mostly avoided any discussion of the fact that the primaries had been rigged against him, campaigned all across the country for Hillary Clinton, and then went on a quote-unquote unity tour with Clinton Democrat Tom Perez, who had defeated uh, Sanders' ally Keith Ellison's bid to replace Deb Debbie Washington Schultz, the corrupt chair of the DNC who was... Uh, fired uh, because it was discovered she was involved in an effort to rig the 2016 primaries on Clinton's behalf, something that Bernie Sanders has never once commented on. Uh, so Sanders ran much of his primary campaign in 2020 
against Biden as if he were already running a general election campaign against Donald Trump, repeatedly claiming that Trump was, quote, the most dangerous president in modern history, focusing on Trump's racism, sexism, xenophobia, alleged homophobia, and religious bigotry. Meanwhile, Sanders displayed his own xenophobia and explicit racism with his neo McCarthyist rhetoric about Russia and his contrasting of, quote, unquote, good European, quote, unquote, democratic socialist governments like Sweden, he calls himself a democratic socialist, with a, quote, unquote, bad authoritarian governments or Cuba or Venezuela, where lots of brown people live. He even essentially Russiagated himself when the corporate media and security state accused Russia of helping his campaign without his knowledge by agreeing that these baseless claims were, were credible. Um, Sanders portrayed Biden as a decent guy who was just mistaken on certain issues, not as a corrupt, warmongering, and mendacious servant of the ruling class that his nearly 50-year political clear, uh, career makes clear that he is. Nor did Sanders or any of Biden's other opponents ever bring up, well, I guess uh, Kamala Harris did early on, uh, the numerous sexual misconduct allegations against Biden. And despite the many cringeworthy moments during the campaign when Biden could not remember obvious facts, such as the name of the president he served under or what office he was running for, couldn't remember what state he was in at, on a, at a campaign stop, uh, or just <laughs> stumbled massively over his words. Uh, Sanders dismissed any question of Biden's mental fitness for the office of president, uh, which the majority of Americans uh, have questions about today, as quote unquote personal attacks. In fact, Sam Sanders touted Bernie's, excuse me, Biden's electability, playing right into the corporate media's own concerted effort to pray, portray Biden as highly electable. He even said he would help Biden win against Trump if Biden were the nominee while he was still supposedly Biden's political opponent. Uh, as Jimmy Dora pointed out at the time, touting Biden's electability basically amounted to campaigning for Biden. Um, so, you know, there, there are kind of echoes uh, with what I just showed you, um, you know, uh, Cornell West saying about Biden with what... Uh, with the attitude that Sanders took toward him, uh, um, you know, uh, in 2020, at least, uh, uh, Cornell West uh, did not. You know, he was not as critical as Biden as he should have been, and you know, as uh, savvy from the uh, Revolutionary Black uh, Network said the other night in talking about this interview, uh, and, you know. As you know, and as she's told Cornell West before, um, yeah, when you're running for president against, you know, as a third party candidate against these corrupt, warmongering representatives of the corporate duopoly, uh, you know, you have to like you get in the ring with these guys in a uh, presidential campaign, you got to knock them the fuck out. You know, both of them, not just one of them, both of them. Um, okay, what, uh, let me just read one more thing I said here. Uh, uh, so uh, Bernie Sanders didn't even really know much of anything at all and certainly didn't say anything about the allegations, uh, uh, very credible, backed up by uh, you know, friends and family members. Uh, allegations of Tara Reid uh, that Joe Biden had uh, raped her in 1993. This man that uh, uh, Bernie Sanders had described as his very as his good friend and a very decent man. Uh, so Sanders you know, remained silent about the allegation until he was asked about it, and then claimed you know he didn't know enough about it to comment further. Um, so you know, my response to that was, you, know, you tell me, do you think maybe Bernie Sanders has a responsibility to know enough about a rape allegation against a man he said is a very decent man? Um, you know, surely he, he had heard the allegation by then, you know, he had a responsibility to look into it and, you know, he didn't. Um, but, uh, I mean, anyway, uh, 
Yeah, I, I'm kind of getting off track here. You know, my point is that, uh, like Bernie Sanders, Cornell West was not sufficiently critical of uh, Joe Biden in 2020, and in fact, wound up endorsing him. Uh, so, let's go back uh, now to the uh, interview. Um, What, what do you say back to that kind of critique that... Okay. The next. That would be one of the ways in which I would try to respond to that. Uh, uh, that would be the beginning of a response to that. Okay. Here's an, another tweet from uh nick he says the same professional managerial class gaslighters want us to take it easy on bernie they use civility politics as a weapon so they can comfortably sell out the working class must reject this and start holding these people accountable for selling us out so bernie has sold us out and i don't need you to call him a sellout or anything that's fine um but i do want to see this is your response because billy bernie was asked about your campaign and he said it was it shouldn't happen and he's against it and he's in board and endorsing right. Bi biden and of course that is just garbage and so this is how you uh responded and, and you know you even in love people have deep disagreements about these things but i think again he's he's fearful of the neo-fascism of trump so when my my uh what i would say to you here and this is a mm -hmm. big point that I, I would try i'm trying to impress upon you going forward that when sure. you do that you 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 sound a little bit like joe biden and what you're doing is you're giving a pass to bernie sanders and anybody else for voting lesser of two evils so you're endorsing the democrats message in their campaign and so now people can dismiss your candidacy and say well we got to worry about the neo-fascism of trump as if joe biden isn't worse which he is he's a bigger fascist and uh he just crushed a union strike on the railroad which is the definition of fascism uh he's now trying i don't think that's the definition of fascism jimmy that's what capitalists uh all do regardless of whether they're uh fascists or not um and you know i, I think uh, jimmy kind of gets lost in the weeds here uh, uh you know as does cornell going back and forth about uh who's more of a fascist or who is a fascist uh trump or biden um so uh and a saber rattle with two uh, nuclear powers, nuclear war, nothing more important than that. And what he's doing in Ukraine, you know exactly what he's doing, right? So he's the worst warmonger in the world. 300,000 Ukrainians have already been slaughtered in this proxy war that was provoked by NATO, which you know. So when when do you think that when you say that about when you call Donald Trump a neo-fascist and you don't say that about uh, Joe Biden, how, what do you say when I tell you that you're undercutting your own campaign and you're you are propping up the Democratic message, which is that they are the lesser of two evil and you have to vote for Joe Biden so we don't have fascism. By the way, we already have fascism, as we all know, the fascism is the joining of corporate and government to screw the worker. And that's exactly what Joe Biden, the Democrats and Pete Buttigieg did. And so they and they will keep doing it and they're not stopping it. And they're they're also for censorship, which is the hallmark of fascism. So this idea that Donald Trump is more of a fascist than Joe Biden undermines your own campaign. There's no doubt about that. And so what I would encourage you to stop doing that. What, what do no, you say I, back? I, I, no, no, we, we, we deeply disagree on that. Though, brother. I don't think, and this is what I disagree with Nick too, that, uh, and I appreciate your, your advice here, you know, cast in, in a respectful way, but we do. And I disagree with brother Nick on this too, that uh, um, the, Man, I just got back from Mississippi. You know that. You know what the Jenkins and Parkins, the two brothers, brutalized by the police. There at the church, the Klan still running wild, uh, not just with votes, but terrorizing black folk. The goon squad finally got caught by the two lawyers, Brother Malik and Brother Trent. Now, what does that mean? That means that when you talk about fascism, 
you're talking not just about the rule of big money. Okay, well, I'm not sure what he just said has to do with uh, whether Trump or Biden is more of a fascist, but, uh, uh, or, okay, he's going to explain here uh, what the distinction is between, in his view, between neoliberalism and fascism and why he thinks uh, Trump uh, fits the latter more than Biden does. Not just the rule of, rule of big military, uh, not just the rule of corporate power so that it's oligarchic in essence but you're also talking about dictatorial rule no elections uh the elimination of dissident voices and then the scapegoating of the most vulnerable which it could be immigrants it could be workers it could be black people jews arabs and so forth see with, with under biden what you have is a fascist dimension domestically, especially against black folk and others. You and I, the very fact that we're having this dialogue without being eliminated overnight, a fascist regime could completely call into question with, 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 with the use of arbitrary power. Okay, well, I mean, that last thing you said is reasonable. I mean, you know, uh, under a full-blown fascist regime, uh, you know, they would not be having that discussion. I would not be doing this podcast, uh, et cetera. Uh, you know, censorship would be much worse. Uh, we'd uh, you know, likely be, you know, dissidents would likely be widely rounded up and put in prison um, but or executed. But, uh, you know, this idea that Biden hasn't done uh, some of the same things that uh Dr. West mentioned here, uh, it, it, you know, it's just not accurate. I mean, we have political prisoners in this country. We have censorship. We have rigged elections. Uh, and the, uh, you know, both parties have uh, uh, done things like uh, suppress people's right to vote through various means, such as, uh, um, you know, playing tricks about uh, uh, how long in advance you needed to get registered. Uh, or, uh, you know, removing people's uh, names from voter registration lists for uh, spurious reasons, like falsely claiming that uh, they were felons, as uh, you know, uh, the Bush campaign did in Florida in 2000. Um, and uh, you know, the Electoral College and... Uh, um, Pledge delegates, uh, delegates who uh, in the Democratic primary can just vote for whoever they want uh, in a given state, regardless of what the uh, voters in that state, uh, which candidates uh, the voters in that state voted for, um, you know, what, what proportion of them voted for different candidates. Uh, so, you know, in 2016, running against Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders, quote unquote, lost uh, many, many states uh, during the Democratic primaries where he had handily won the popular vote against uh, um, Hillary Clinton uh, due to those delegates who um, I mean, largely had committed themselves to Hillary Clinton before any votes were cast in the primary. Uh, so... You know, to the extent that fascism relates to a lack of democracy, uh, <laughs> there's an awful lot of lack of democracy here in the United States, which doesn't make it full-blown fascist. But, uh, you know, contrary to what Cornell West is claiming here, uh, both the Democrats and Republicans are uh, you know, doing things uh, along those lines. That's what happens in the mass incarceration regime vis-a-vis -vis poor black people and others. Right. So that is the fascist dimension. And, Similarly and, and, so in terms of militarism abroad. So that there's fascist elements, my brother, fascist dimensions. But with Trump, when you have calling in the question transfer of power and so forth, that is not the same thing. And so that, that doesn't undermine my campaign at all. The 100%. campaign's about truth. 
Hundred percent undermines your campaign. Hundred percent, you're shooting no yourself way. right in the dick no before way. you even start. Not so that's just all. bad. You're getting bad advice. I don't know who's advising you, but it's they're giving you horrible advice. advice. I'm January, myself. I'm a free man. I'm a free man, okay. brother. I'm a so January, man. but I want to hear your argument. I want to hear your argument. Okay. Well, I mean, that's kind of patronizing here when Jimmy says, uh, "Well, I don't know." Who's advising you? Uh, you know, as if uh, you know Cornell West couldn't uh, make up his own mind about any of this. And you know, some of the people advising him were people like Jill Stein and Ajamu Baraka and Chris Hedges, who uh, you know, uh, frankly disagree with Cornell West and agree with Jimmy Dore about this particular issue of how to uh, characterize uh, Joe Biden. Um, Let's see. Do I want to say anything more about? Oh, uh, I'll just skip the rest of this particular segment. Uh, but uh, uh, Dor ended it by saying, "It's like West is uh, campaigning for Biden," which I thought that was uh, rather hyperbolic, to say the least. Um, okay, let's uh, go to uh, a part of this where Dor makes a case for Biden being a fascist. Um, let me see. Everything except the message of your campaign, right? That's the only thing. I, I, I would hope it would uh, become even more folk. Well, let me just put it this way. But, but, but are you suggesting that the message should be that Biden is a greater fascist than Trump? Is no, that what you're saying? I, no, I, I'm not saying that you should talk about fascism or any of that stuff. I think you should. No, tr- fascism is very real. I think you, don't you think should. Fascism is real in the country. It's we're living in it. We're living in fascism. But I'm talking about escalating in terms of intensity. You, you know, it has the, since since Biden became president. It certainly has en- escalated in intensity. They've censored everybody. They've crushed unions. They've tried. They've started another war, and now they're saber rattling with two nuclear powers. I don't know how what they, they, I don't know how worse it could get. And by the way, he still hasn't let people out of prison. He still hasn't given student loans. He's still denying us health care. He doesn't. He's an enemy of the worker and a tool of military industrial complex and Wall Street. There's no bigger fascist in the country than Joe Biden. The reason why black around people are locked up again isn't because of Trump. It's because of brother Biden. And Joe Biden is a, is proud of that. He brags about that. He brags about the crime bill and he will never apologize for it. So I'm just letting you know that I really want your campaign to pick up traction. This is the opposite way to do it. Who's ever advising you sounds like an infiltrator. Oh, but, but but why do you keep saying advising? I'm thinking for myself, brother. I'm a okay, I don't mean to insult man. you. That's not just question of advice. Okay. I don't, I don't ask who, who's advising you. Good point. Um, so, uh, Jimmy certainly could have. Uh, you made his point in a uh, a lot more diplomatic way here, but uh, you know, I, I I do agree with his uh, point here, uh, you know, more or less. I mean, you certainly, uh, you know. Certainly, Trump did a lot of fascistic things on his own. Uh, you know, the arrest of Julian Assange, for instance, uh, the um, you know, assassination of uh, one of Iran's uh, uh, prominent leaders, a, a general who uh, you know, did a lot to fight terrorism in the Middle East, um, you know, the uh, Military occupation of uh, Syria's oil fields and wheat fields, and uh, you know, uh, coup attempt in Venezuela, coup in Bolivia. Um, you know, there, there was a lot there, uh, but uh, you know, on the other hand, um, you know, there has been you know, you know a general pattern of uh, censorship in social media escalating since Biden's been president. Uh, you know, during the Biden campaign, uh, you know, a story about uh, you know Hunter Biden was uh, you know, was literally censored from uh, from Twitter and Facebook and uh, you know the uh, mass media like the New York Post lost its Twitter account for breaking the story and you couldn't you couldn't tweet about it uh, et cetera um, and uh, you know of course uh, 
the war in Ukraine began under the Biden administration. And uh, um, you know, that, that was certainly a long time in the making. And uh, you, uh, some of you will say, well, Russia invaded Ukraine. Well, you know, uh, as I've talked about at length on the show and uh, you written about at length on my blog, uh, this was definitely a uh, you know, provoked war and uh, the Biden administration certainly escalated the provocations. Um, Okay, now we're going to get into a part of the interview where you know, I uh, you know, agree with Wes's uh, perspective and very much disagree with uh, uh, Doors. Um, Say this. So the point of running a third-party campaign is is uh, to offer an alternative to the two major parties to bring together disaffected members of those parties along with independents and others who feel alienated from the political system as it exists and and the best way to do this is by running on economic issues that unite us but which neither major party is willing to address because they're both beholden to the same powerful corporate interests the democratic party long ago abandoned the working class in favor of beating the drum on cultural issues and now that's all the democrats have to run on so if voters are looking for a party running on trans rights and calling Donald Trump and his supporters white supremacists, they can already vote for Democrats. The role of a third party is to focus not on the identity politics that divide us, but on core economic issues that unite us along class lines like Christian Smalls did at Staten Island. Do you think he, he led with LGBTQ trans rights and white supremacy? Or do you think he organized along class lines? That's what we have to do. You have to organize organize meet people where they are that's a, so what is your plan to organize along class lines or are you going to keep talking about white supremacy and all those identity politics which are there not from the ground up from the top down to make sure we stay divided what is your plan to organize along class lines well i appreciate again the clarity and candor okay well <laughs> that was just rude as fuck for one thing um and uh you know let's just let's look at um cornell west website here uh because uh okay let me see if i can uh is there a way to switch uh what is being shown here uh, sorry guys i'm not very familiar with uh stream yard uh so let me just remove that and you know, add it back. All right, there we go. So uh, here's the issues page of Cornell West's uh, website. And you tell me, is uh, um, Cornell West's uh, a vision centered around identity politics, uh, or uh, does he, in fact, emphasize uh, you know, class? Um Policies, dismantling the empire, vastly cutting back on military spending, dissolving non-defensive security alliances, including NATO and AUKUS, that's Australia, the UK, and the US alliance, dismantling the global network of over 800 military bases and severing the link between US foreign policy and corporate profits to respect national sovereignty and the principle of self-determination for people. The USA should be a decent and dignified nation among nations rather than an imperial power dominating every corner of the globe. Withdrawing foreign aid to Egypt, Israel, and any other countries violating the human rights of subjugated peoples. Increasing humanitarian aid to poor and vulnerable people around the world. Enabling international peace by highlighting ecological sustainability. 
abolishing nuclear weapons and promoting diplomatic processes. Uh, certainly seems very class-based and uh, centered around uh, the general public interest there <laughs> to me. I don't know about you. Uh, unleashing democracy, massive investments in satisfying the social needs of everyday people. Medicare for all, all, everyone, <laughs> including humane mental health care, decriminalization of drugs, creation of humane uh, rehabilitation sites, decent housing for all, quality education for all, free college tuition for all, and jobs with living wages for all, Jimmy, for all. Abolishing poverty and houselessness, targeting the vicious legacy of white supremacy. <gasps> There's something that doesn't affect white people. <laughs> uh, we can't have that. Um, by ending mass incarceration, demilitarizing policing, abolishing cop cities, uh, which is something Jimmy also supports, actually, and promoting reparations for past undecent treatment of black people. Not sure whether uh, Jimmy supports reparations or not. Prioritizing the empowerment of indigenous peoples, protecting the reproductive rights of women, and ending all forms of patriarchy. Securing the rights of LGBTQ plus and trans peoples. I'm not sure why LGBTQ plus uh, doesn't also include trans people. That's kind of strange uh, wording there. But anyway, treating every migrant and asylum seeker with dignity and implementing fundamental changes in immigration policies. Public financing of elections with ranked choice voting, eliminating the Electoral College, and a national holiday for, holiday for voting. Democrat democratizing unaccountable monopolies and oligopolies with workers' control, saving the planet, fighting back against the escalating ecological catastrophe by targeting the corporate greed of fossil fuel companies and resurrecting the Green New Deal, shifting from extraction and emission to regenerative and renewable energy, eliminating the environmental racism that disproportionately damages the life chances of poor people, especially poor people of color here and abroad, but no. You know, poor people also includes poor white people, Jimmy. Uh, the future of life on this planet depends on this fundamental shift. Okay. <laughs> you know, I don't know about you, but uh, to me, it seems pretty clear that this is a platform that uh, very much emphasizes uh, you know, uh, campaigning for uh, issues that have uh, universal appeal to the working class, uh, regardless of their uh, specific demographics. Now, um, does that mean that uh, we shouldn't, you know, uh, appeal to uh, specific groups uh, within the American working class if we're, you know, campaigning for uh, political office? Uh, so, should we talk about, uh, you know, Systemic racism. Should we talk about uh, discrimination against women or lesbian and gay people or uh, you know, trans people or you know uh, immigrants or whoever it is? Uh, you know, my my view on that is, well, of course we should, uh, because I mean, you know, it's a social justice issue in its own right. And by the way, uh, you know, as some of you know, I am a vegan. I support animal rights. Uh, and that's uh, not an issue that directs effect, directly affects uh, humans, but uh, it's an issue of uh, justice. Um, and uh, if we're going to build a movement for social justice, uh, that movement you know, has to be based on solidarity. You know, it cannot just be you know, a matter of self-interest. Uh, you know, people have to... Uh, be encouraged to care about other people and uh, their problems and their issues, uh, regardless of whether it directly affects them. Um, as, uh, as as Savvy pointed out in uh, her analysis of this interview, though, uh, often uh, what looks at first like an issue that only affects uh, certain groups, such as black people, uh, it winds up having a universal impact. So, uh, you know, she talked about how uh, there, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that a major reason why we don't have universal health care in this country uh, is that there was a concerted effort to try and prevent black people from getting health insurance uh, you know, across much of the history of this country. Um, and you know, the ways that uh, they uh, tried to do that 
you know, as, as you might expect, um, didn't only wind up uh, making it hard for uh, black people to get insurance. Because, uh, you know, if, in, if for instance, um, health care is pretty unaffordable, you know, it's going to be you know, unaffordable for you know, lots and lots of people, regardless of their ethnicity, their sex, uh, you know, or, you know, other characteristics. Uh, so, so let's hear how uh, Cornell you know, responds to what you have to say. We have profound disagreements, brother who comes out of a tradition that's been terrible. Uh, let's see. Terrorized and traumatized by white elites. And that, that does not in any way mean it takes me away from class issue. Class issues are crucial. Trans class issues are fundamental. But it doesn't mean that I'm putting up with white supremacy. One of the problems is that you get too many folk who want to talk class, 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 and can't say a mumbling word about white supremacy, police brutality, uh -huh. can't say a mumbling word hardly. Or when they do uh -huh. say it, you call it identity politics as if it's not connected to class. I'm hitting these head on. Mm -hmm. I'm standing with the workers when it comes to strikes. I'm standing with the workers when it comes to greedy bosses. I'm standing with the workers when it comes to obsession with profits and the needs not in any way being satisfied. But I'll never for a minute be silent or not, uh, or not raising my voice in terms of vicious treatment of black people, indigenous people, gay brothers, lesbians, sisters, or trans. It's not an either or. And that's, that's where you and I have a deep, profound disappointment. So if I see... <laughs> Little Freudian slip there, he meant disagreement, but he said disappointment, which, you know, it is a disappointment to him that uh, you know, Jimmy isn't getting this, that uh, you, you can't only, you know, talk about issues that affect everyone uh, you know if you want to build a movement that appeals to everyone because you know, there are issues that are important to certain constituents and if people you know are have any sense of uh, egalitarianism and solidarity and you know empathy with other people rather than being you know uh, self-centered sociopaths uh, then you know a lot of this is going to appeal to them too uh, you know and you know, again, injustice and you know the flip side of what I was saying uh, earlier. Well, I guess it's kind of the same thing. You know, injustices that affect you know a, a specific group disproportionately, such as uh, police uh, violence, which disproportionately is directed toward uh, uh, black and brown people in this country. Uh, you know, nonetheless, uh, also affect. You know, it affects everyone. Uh, you know, because police aren't only violent toward black people or uh, you know, Hispanic people or, or what have you. Uh, uh, and, you know, there are many examples of that. I mean, certainly, healthcare being uh, one of them. Um, so, and then here uh, in the next part, uh, Cornell. He points out you know, sort of a bigger philosophical issue here as to you know, why he uh, you know, campaigns the way he does and you know, uh, participates in social movements the way he does, rather than the way Jimmy would uh, uh, apparently like him to. Oh, you're do you I don't disagree with what you're saying. I'm talking about having a campaign. I'm not there's a okay, so um But the campaign I, is not about utilitarian calculation either. I don't look at black people like a utilitarian calculation. I can't say nothing because these people over here somehow are alienated. I'm telling the truth, I'm fighting for justice. And if people feel as if to talk about white supremacy is alienating, then they're gonna be alienated. I'm talking about my mama. I'm talking about my daddy. This ain't no abstract dialogue about politics in the Machiavellian no, wow. sense. Not so, at all, so my what, brother. What 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 Not Bernie so caught? We marched together for class politics. We marched together because that's real. 
But if you, if you think that talking about white supremacy is just identity politics, we got deep disagreement. That's all. Okay. I mean, you know, it affects him personally. So why the hell would he not talk about it, Jimmy? Why the hell would he not? Um, I got to say, as much as Jimmy had a good point about uh, I mean, the, the rhetoric of uh, uh, how Cornell has talked about Biden and Trump, uh, you know, making it seem like there's a bigger difference between them than there is. Uh, you know, I just think he's completely off base here and uh, um, you know, ju <laughs> just doesn't get it. Uh, and, you know, misrepresents what Cornell is doing. He's not leading with, quote unquote, identity politics. Uh, it's very much a, a class based uh, platform, as you saw there. And uh, judging from the you know, many interviews of Cornell that I've listened to, uh, you know, that that's how he uh, campaigns uh, rhetorically as well. Um, OK, one last thing here that. Uh, um, they get into, and I haven't heard much commentary about it because, uh, you know, it's, um, uh, very controversial and a lot of people avoid the issue is, uh, uh, Jimmy Dore brings up, uh, COVID. Um, and okay, I'll just, I'll just play what he says here and, uh, respond to it. Um, Let's see, where does it begin? 3509. All right. What I got to do, and I learned from you, and I hope you can learn a little bit from me, but we shall see. The biggest story of my lifetime, if it wasn't Russiagate, uh, which led directly to the Ukraine war. And I said it was going to in 2017 when they did this. And I told everybody at the Young Turks, they're going to use this to start a war. They're going to use this. And they did. And so here we. Oh, uh, I, I should just mention, since this reminded me of it, uh, at one point earlier in the interview, uh, Jimmy uh, said that Trump didn't uh, send weapons to Ukraine, whereas Biden uh, did. And you know, that that just isn't true. Trump also sent weapons to uh, Ukraine. Um, he didn't start a war with Ukraine. Uh, um, you might have if he'd gotten reelected. Who knows? Um, and Hillary Clinton very well might have had she been elected instead of Donald Trump. But in any case, uh, you know, not true that Trump didn't uh, arm Nazis in Ukraine. He certainly did. Anyway, we are. And uh, so. What I want to re the, the, the second biggest story is probably the COVID lockdown, if not the biggest. And so many people who were supposed to be out in front on this dropped the ball. Uh, people like Noam Chomsky. So here's the Green Party, what they said. They said the Green Party, which you're running with, the Green Party of the United States Steering Committee strongly supports the use of vaccines, vaccine mandates and quarantines as part of a comprehensive public health effort to curb and eradicate the novel coronavirus pandemic that has swept the globe since early 2020. The whole thing was a hoax. And here's what the. OK, what? What the fuck does he mean by that? Is he the whole thing? What, what do you mean, Jimmy? <laughs> COVID was a hoax. Come on. <laughs> um, you know, the, the Economist, uh, and by the way, uh, YouTube, uh, one of the platforms I'm sharing this on, uh, I do not mean I agree with Jimmy that COVID was a hoax or whatever. I am saying that Jimmy is saying this and he's full of shit. Um, and, um, I'm not sure exactly what he's saying is a, is a hoax actually, um, you may be uh, the Green uh, Party steering committee's advocacy of lockdowns and uh, uh, vaccine mandates. I'm not sure. Um, so now he's quoting the uh, Black Caucus of the Green Party, which uh, released a statement uh, uh, rejecting mandates and critical of uh, lockdowns. And so let's and he reads this whole thing. You know, he could have summarized it, but uh, you know, waste several minutes of. Uh, um, Cornell West time. Um, not sure if I want to be a hypocrite and uh, 
and let him read the whole thing here or not. Uh, um, okay, we're not up to an hour yet, so maybe I'll go ahead. Black Caucus of the Green Party said, they said the National Black Caucus of the Green Party of the United States strongly opposes the use of forced vaccination via mandates and the discrimination that is being generated around these policies. Lockdowns, mandates and passports are the major issue of the day with millions of people protesting against them worldwide. In fact, what has become known as the medical freedom movement is arguably the biggest and most diverse international movement in world history. Vaccine mandates and vaccine passports are a among the most vile, unconstitutional, immoral, unscientific, discriminatory, and outright criminal policies ever forced upon the population and goes against everything the Green Party stands for under social justice. Okay, so, I, I mean, I don't know what you think, guys, but uh, I... Uh you strongly disagreed at the time and uh, disagree today with the um, Green Party of Black Caucus's statement opposing lockdowns and vaccine mandates, which, you know, to be honest, reads like it was written by the Libertarian Party, not uh, members of the uh, Green Party. Um, you know, th this idea that, uh, you know, um, this was like, you know, the major issue of our time or something like that. Um, the major issue of the day, they said, you know, as a po lockdowns, mandates, and passports are the major issue of the day, they said. Um, and that uh, the quote-unquote medical freedom movement is arguably the biggest and most diverse international movement in world history. Well, you know, that very same year, um, or, you know, the year before, actually, you know, like during uh, the uh, early days of COVID, uh, the uh, upsurge in Black Lives Matter protests uh, stemming from the murder of George Floyd and other uh, police uh, violence that took place at around that time in uh, uh, spring of 2020, <laughs> those were the biggest <laughs> you know, protests uh, in uh, modern history, you know, by far. Uh, you did the uh, anti-vax slash mandate slash lockdown protests were uh, nowhere as near as big as that. Um, and, you know, as for their statement that vaccine mandates and vaccine passports among the most vile, unconstitutional, immoral, unscientific, discriminatory, and outright criminal policies ever enforced upon the population and goes against everything the Green Party stands for under social justice, well, you know, I'm sorry, as a, you know, a uh, you know, longtime supporter and former candidate with the Green Party who's thoroughly familiar with their platform and what they've stood for over the years, uh, this characterization of the Green Party's uh, views and principles is utter bullshit. Um, and you know, this idea that vaccine mandates are, you know, all the things they said, um, you know, we've had van vaccine mandates in this country for well over a hundred years. Um, they have uh, you know, saved an awful lot of people from being killed or uh, you know, severely harmed by uh various infectious diseases such as smallpox and measles and, uh, and you know, and COVID. Um, you know, I can uh, share with you in the description, you know, studies on uh, you know, various uh, policies efficacy in uh, preventing COVID infections and uh, you know, illnesses and uh, deaths, you know, including not only vaccine mandates, uh, but also mask mandates and uh, you know, vaccines in general and the you know, dreaded uh, lockdowns. Um, and, you know, th this idea that uh, they're immoral, well, <laughs> again, you guys, uh, you know, Black uh, Caucus of the Green Party sound like fucking libertarians. I mean, uh, you only care about the quote-unquote rights of, uh, um, you know, the small minority of individuals who uh, you just... Uh, you reject out of hand uh, vaccinations and uh, uh, you refuse to uh, get vaccinated, um, you know, as opposed to, uh, 
you know, many medically vulnerable people in our society who, uh, you know, uh, here the evidence suggests are you know, a lot more likely to uh, uh, both get infected and become severely ill from COVID than uh, you know, most people are. Uh, you know, not that most people aren't very likely to get infected with COVID if they're in an environment where it's prevalent and, you know, there's nobody wearing a mask or being vaccinated or, you know, ventilation is terrible and so forth. Um, you know, anyway, um, the unfortunate thing here, in my opinion, is that, uh, Cornell West largely agrees with, uh, um, this statement. Uh, you know, he, he didn't say anything about it at the time it was issued in December of 21, but he says he now agrees with it, uh, but that isn't enough for Jimmy, you know, as we'll uh, see. So so let's continue. Unconstitutional, immoral, unsophisticated journalists who have an opposing view or who even question the current main is being violated. Constitutionally protected rights to movement and assembly, including the right to travel, are being threatened. Rights to normal societal participation are being decimated. It has taken a while, but more recently, many medical professionals, elected officials, and federal judges have come out fully against lockdowns, vaccine mandates, vaccine passports, and of course, massive censorship. Uh, I guess uh, you know, a question that comes to mind uh, you know, is, uh, you know, this was, uh, you know, three years ago when we had the lockdowns, um, you know, and, uh, you know, for the most part, it's been, you know, at least a year, if not two, uh, since, uh, there were, you know, widespread vaccine mandates. Um, and, uh, you know, not very many people, uh, and lost their jobs or whatever uh, because of vaccine mandates, uh, contrary to what uh, Jimmy would uh, like you to believe. Um, uh, you know, I, I guess I just have to wonder why you know, Jimmy Dore is so big mad about this that he's still talking about it uh, two or three years later and portraying this as like you know the major issue of our time or, or some crap like this uh, when we have you know. Uh, you know, a, a war that uh, could escalate and possibly go nuclear at any time. And we've got you know, poverty and uh, police violence. And, uh, you know, by the way, Jimmy, we had a pandemic that killed, you know, uh, well over a million people here in the United States, uh, 1.4 million estimated, you know, estimated 25 million worldwide. Um, you know, uh, I mean, you know, if we're going to just stick within that narrow frame, um, you know, COVID itself was a much bigger problem than uh, uh, vaccine mandates or lockdowns, uh, even though certainly um, you know, there has been an adverse economic impact of uh, uh, you know, lockdowns on, on many people. Um, but uh, you know, there's been an adverse economic impact of a lot of things, including you know, the sanctions against uh, uh, Russia that have backfired and sent uh, European economies into a tailspin and, uh, you know, on and on with the you know, poor economic uh, policy making of uh, Western uh, countries. Um, but you know, vaccine mandates and lockdowns, the number one issue, according to Jimmy Dore. Give me a break. The National Black Caucus of the Green Party of the United States adheres to the principle that informed consent. I just want to, I don't understand why you aren't outraged by that. Why don't, do you share the sentiment of the Black Caucus of the Green Party and have you talked to them? Well, one thing is good to have a Green Party where you have a variety of different voices that are clashing and the tensions are very real. I think there's no doubt that the pharmaceutical company has played a disproportionate role in shaping public policy. I think there, the kind of concerns that you and RFKJR and, and others have certainly are well well grounded in that sense. On the other hand, we know there's been a whole host no, of vaccine in regard to other kinds of uh, illnesses that, that are much more effective. The question becomes making sure, and one of the things I want to do, I want to have a truth commission to find out exactly what was the level of corruption that took place during these years, be able to see not just the text, we know the books are out there, but to have a truth commission 
so that we can see what voices were marginalized, what voices were pushed aside, and make sure it never happens again. I resonate with the spirit of what my green black brothers and sisters are saying, but the Green Party itself. Okay, so, you know, he's largely uh, agreeing, which, uh, sorry, Cornell, I do disagree completely with you here and with Jimmy, but he's largely agreeing with uh, the uh, statement of the uh, you know, Black Caucus of the Green Party, and, and Jimmy's uh, you know, all excited here, cheering him on, but watch what happens when he doesn't agree with Jimmy that this is like the, you know, the pressing issue of modern times or something does allow this kind of disagreement and so on. But I'll say this though, but I know I got to go, but I must say, see, this is where you and I do in some ways live in different worlds because as, as crucial and as important as the issue of vaccines and the COVID situation was, when you say that's probably the most important issue in your lifetime or in the last 25 or 30 years in light of all the wars, in light of what Palestinians are going through, in light of what workers are going through, 63% of them living paycheck to paycheck in terms of all the vicious attacks of the police and the murders and so forth. And yet this vaccine issue is the most important thing. I say, okay, that's my dear brother, Jimmy. He's got a right to raise his voice. I'm not going to in any way push it away, but I just live in a different world. As important as vaccines have been, if I had another chance, I'd be leaning much more with the Black Caucus. But that, but what I think of the, the weightiest issues Vaccines does not come immediately to mind. It just doesn't. That's the kind of world we live in, brother. Okay. Maybe I'll spend, you know. Well, here it is. The black you know business what, I, owners I, brother, I, I, collapsed I, 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 by forty-one percent. Black business because of lockdowns. It, do you care yet? Well, no, seventy thousand workers in one state were fired because of vaccine mandates. When are you going to care? Do they all have to be trans? How do you? When are you going to care about no, these no, workers? No, 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 what are you going to? Okay, so he's just getting totally fucking rude here. Uh, saying you know, he won't care about them unless they're trans or something and uh, you know, making a false statement. Uh, you know, it's not true that 70,000 workers in New York State were fired uh, because of uh, uh, vaccine mandates. Uh, um, you know, about 90, I forget the exact percentage, but it was in the upper 90s uh, of percentage of people who got vaccinated, uh, you know, with... Uh, Healthcare uh, companies and hospital systems uh, mandating vaccines. You know, same with uh, other sectors of the economy, airlines. Uh, same with universities. You know, 90 plus percent of uh, students uh, got vaccinated. You uh, know, I live here in uh, Bloomington, Indiana. You know, uh, you know, they had a vaccine mandate. You know, almost all the students uh, got vaccinated. I heard very little complaint about it. Um, it just wasn't the issue that uh, Jimmy is making it out to be. Um, but uh, um, you know, you know, just see here how uh, Jimmy's getting so bent out of shape about the fact that Cornell doesn't agree with him, that this is like you know, the major issue of our time or something. Um, and, you know, you know the, the hypocrisy here of him saying, you know, Cornell shouldn't talk about "quote unquote" identity politics uh, to any significant degree uh, during his campaign because it's divisive. But here he is, uh, you know, saying this, you know, buying into these conspiracy theories about COVID and vaccines, and um, you know, uh, calling uh, the uh, you know, vaccines in combination with the um, you mandates forced medical experiments, you know, uh, as if, uh, you know, I mean, you know, I, I can cite you tons and tons of research that was done on COVID vaccines, you know, hundreds and hundreds of studies showing that they were uh, safe and effective. You know, published peer reviewed research, uh, uh, you know, they were uh, tested you know, just as thoroughly as any other vaccines. The time frame was compressed because we were in a fucking pandemic. Um, so you know, massive amounts of uh, government funding were thrown at, uh, uh, were made available to uh, developers of vaccines around the world. Um, and so they were able to move much more quickly than is generally the case. Um, and yeah, people 
who had legitimate magic medical reasons uh, for not getting vaccinated were able to uh, not get them. Um, so, so anyway, um, you know, my point is just, you know, um, he's taking a very, very, uh, you know, controversial and divisive, uh, you know, view here, you know, as he has for the last couple of years. And then he's claiming that, uh, Cornell West is, uh, doing so when, you know, he's just doing, you know, as he points out, you know, what he's been doing his you know, whole adult life, you know, decades and decades, you know, campaigning for uh, civil rights. Um, and, uh, you know, why wouldn't he? Um, so, uh, <laughs> Let's see, do I want to... Okay, yeah, I'll just play the rest of this rather heated exchange here. Care about this? What are you going to care about this? They have to be trans for me to care about this. You don't care. Why don't you care about this? Why would you accuse me? Of course I care about it. You're saying saying it's not important. I I didn't say it wasn't important. I said it was not the most fundamental (laughs) issue in my lifetime the last 30 years. Forced medical experiments? Forced medical experiments? The Tuskegee? Where's the nuance? Oh, my God. Where's the complexity? So you missed this story and you're not interested in getting it right. You agree with Jimmy Dore. So you missed this story and you're not interested. Well, Dr. West, I wish you the best. You know I love you. You know I support you. And your precious wife. I lo- okay, I wish you all the best. I love you. Thanks for coming on. I really do wish you all the best. And I just wish you had a clearer message to reach people, but you don't. It's muddled and it's a loser. Okay. Yeah, I mean, basically, he's just yelling at uh, Cornell West here. And, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to hear because they were both talking. But, uh, you know, uh, the gist of what uh, Cornell seemed to be saying there at the end was, uh, you know, uh, it seems like everybody has to kind of mark and march in lockstep with Jimmy Dore's views or he'll uh, disrespect them as he was uh, doing here. Um, and, you know, I won't uh, show this to you. You can watch the interview for yourself uh, or the segment for yourself. But uh, Dora concluded the segment with an infomer- infomercial for a um, – anti-vax doctor that he's interviewed on the show before for some, I don't know, some quack uh, treatment to boost your immune system or something. Um, so, you know, if it wasn't obvious to you before, it uh, certainly should be obvious if you watch this. Uh, you know, Jimmy Dore's making money off of uh, you know, promoting um, these uh, outlier views on you know, vaccines and uh, other things related to uh, COVID. Um, it's just hard to understate the irony of Jimmy advocating that Cornell downplay "quote unquote" identity politics, you know, systematic racism, and so forth, on the grounds that it's divisive, while he himself constantly promotes views on anything having to do with COVID that are thoroughly outside the mainstream, including uh, outside of the majority view on the left and. You know, uh, has it escaped his notice? Uh, how much uh, RFK Jr.'s uh, failure to gain traction has to do with that? Um, and you know, one last thought: uh, I couldn't help noticing how much more polite Jimmy was to RFK Jr. when he had him on for an interview, you know, about a month ago, despite his uh, horrific views on you know, the Israel-Palestine issue. Um, you know, than he was to Cornell West. Um, but, uh, you know, as many people have pointed out, so, uh, you know, there, there is a silver lining of this, uh, you know, kind of disastrous interview, which is, uh, um, you know, uh, we on the left do need to talk about uh, issues where we disagree. And, you know, that certainly happened here, although not in the most constructive way it could have happened. But, uh, you know, hopefully... Uh, constructive uh, conversation uh, will uh, ensue, and uh, you know, maybe maybe the you know, this blow up will uh, you know, be helpful to us in the long run. Um, 
Okay. Uh, that's all I have for you tonight, and I will uh, see you next time.